Welcome to Law Venture, a channel devoted to lawyers and future lawyers. My name is Jarrett Stone. Not only am I a lawyer, but I am the owner of Stone Firm PLC. But more importantly, I'm going to be your guide to breaking down this video. Johnny Depp laughs. Amber Heard's lawyer objects to his own question. The good, the bad, the ugly. There's a lot of ugly in it. I watched it one time and I did not like what I ended up seeing. To be honest with you, a lot of secondhand embarrassment is still kind of resonating in my soul. That's not a good thing. And I'm also coming into this trial as a whole completely cold. No idea really what the claim's about. No idea at what point in the trial this clip occurred, but we're going to run with it. We're going to go with it. So let's start at the very beginning. We're not coming in hot on this one. An awkward silence. Do you recognize th this picture? Asking the question, do you recognize this picture, is not the best way to handle that. You want to be very technical when you're in trial. You need to have a clean appellate record. So if the picture is an exhibit, which it should be, then the question needs to be, do you recognize what's been marked as defendant's exhibit whatever? That way it's clear on the record and it's clear to everyone else exactly what photo you're talking about, especially if the witness has multiple pictures in front of them. I don't know if that's the case, but again, it's all about being as specific as possible. So a critique pretty quickly getting into this. Not seen this picture before. Were these the, cu were these the cuts? Did you see cuts like this on Miss Heard? Is that Miss Heard? Why don't we put up 376C? Oh man, we're not really getting very far into this before pointing out all the mistakes. The lawyer for Amber Heard is not one laying a foundation properly before talking about an exhibit. That's a big no-no. And two, needs to establish the personal knowledge that this witness has on the photo to ultimately lay the foundation to him being able to talk and testify about the contents of that photo. He's not gonna be able to talk about the cuts of Amber Heard on the photo if he doesn't know that that's Amber Heard. He doesn't have that knowledge. So that needs to be established well before getting into this line of questioning. Were these the, cu were these the cuts? Did, did you see cuts like this on Miss Heard? Is that Miss Heard? Why don't we put up 376C? to change his exhibits. Do you recognize the person in that picture? That's Miss Hood. All right. Okay, so notice the mistake here. And I know it's fairly obvious to the viewer, but we want to be very technical for a clear record. The lawyer just asked if he recognized Miss Hurd in the photo. Which photo are we talking about? It's fairly obvious to somebody watching the video that the photo we're talking about is this second exhibit but it seems like there are now multiple photos up there. So again, talk about the exhibit and refer to the photo by the exhibit name for a clear record. Did you see cuts like that, which are on her left arm? That's not a leading question. You wanna ask leading questions during cross or you lose control. Similar to that long, like I described earlier, long, thin cuts, um, pretty uniform cuts. These were the cut. It, it was the cuts were like this on her kind of wrist forearm area. Is that right? I don't know what the date of this photograph is, but they look pretty uniform like they do here. Yes. So these series of questions are improper. There needs to be an objection made by Johnny Depp's lawyers at this point in time. And here's why this exhibit, meaning the photo that this witness is now talking about has not been admitted into evidence. It is not part of the record. And because it's not part of the record, you can't talk about the contents of the exhibit in front of the jury because it's not part of the record. It hasn't been admitted. I'd like to enter uh, 376C into evidence? Any objection? Uh, no, no objection. Okay, 376C in evidence. Yeah, that was, that, <laughs> that was just rough, I think. The other side is maybe throwing a bone to the cross-examining attorney. That wasn't a clean introducing of evidence. Was it? 
So now the exhibit's being published to the jury for the jury to be able to see, which is why we can see it on video. And can we put back up 376G? Seeing 376C, is this consistent with the scratches on 376G, or are these consistent with the scratches you saw in Ms. Hurd? By the way, it's totally okay to mess up a question. I do it all the time. Just be sure to say strike that so that it's clear that the question you started and ultimately kind of fumbled a little bit with, like I almost fumbled that sentence, just say strike that and then re-ask your question so it's clear exactly what you're asking. I don't see a date. Is that the same time? Is that the same date? Oh, my, I mean, the, my question are, is, are the scratches similar to what you saw in Ms. Hurd? These are uniform kind of long, thin scratches, yes. Cups, I'd like to enter scratches. 376G in evidence. Any objections? It's not proper I mean, foundation. foundation. He yeah. hasn't authenticated the document through this witness. I mean, I'm just asking if the pictures are consistent with I'll what allow he's... I'll 376G in evidence. The judge threw the cross-examining attorney a bone there. Again, there's no foundational knowledge. Uh, yeah, there, there needs to be a better foundation laid instead of just asking a question about a document, getting an opinion about the document without the document being admitted. That's just improper and this, this shouldn't be happening. The judge should have actually sustained the objection and asked for the cross-examining attorney to lay the proper foundation first but the judge was being nice there. See scratches on the photo. But again, we don't necessarily know that that's Amber Heard's scratches, arm, or any of that. Now, you were in the house, you said, for 12 to 13. Did he just move on? He just went through a very bad showing of getting exhibits admitted into the record and doesn't actually ask any questions beyond what he improperly asked earlier. Yeah, that's, that's weird. That's really weird. He needs to actually use the exhibits he's fumbling through in order to make a point. And it sounds like the point he's trying to eventually make is that the scratches occurred at a certain date and time which maybe is part of formulating a timeline. Again, I'm coming into this super cold. And if that's the case, then why are you using this expert? Why not have one of your own witnesses corroborate exactly the timeline of things? Now, you were in the house, you said, for 12 to 13 hours on March 8th, 20. 15, correct? Correct, going into March 9th, 2015. Okay, so we're gonna stop it here because this cross-examining lawyer just broke a very simple rule. And we have a video called the one fact, one question technique for cross-examination, which will elevate your cross-examination exponentially because it makes your cross questions so simple and so clear and in doing so, so powerful. The question that this lawyer just asked is yes, a leading question, which is what you need to be doing during cross-examination, but he has multiple facts within the question that makes the question not only very cumbersome, but it takes away his own rhythm. So let's maybe back it up and go through this as a great teaching moment. Okay. Now, you were in the house, you said, for 12 to 30. Okay, first fact, you were in the house. The question needs to be, at some point, you went to the house, correct? Yes. In fact, you went to the house on this date. Yes. And while you were at the house, you were there for this amount of time, correct? Yes. So, in doing so, you're laying down one fact, one question, but you're establishing the rhythm and ultimately pushing the client in the direction, the flow of the conversation that you want it to go. This is too cumbersome, too complicated. The cross-examining lawyer is making his job a little bit harder. And isn't it true that in the entire time you were there, you were not informed as to what caused damage to Mr. Depp's hand on finger on March 8th? Objection, hearsay. I'm asking what he wasn't told. 
I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Okay, so hearsay is confusing. If you're not familiar with the basics of hearsay, I'll slide a video above. I also have a step-by-step -step process for analyzing hearsay that should be sliding above if the other one has slid back. Check those out in order to get a better understanding of hearsay. In this situation, I think the cross-examining lawyer is correct. He's asking a question that doesn't involve an out-of-court statement that's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. He's not asking for a statement. He's asking for the opposite. So I think the judge goofed a little bit by sustaining this objection because I'm not hearing an out-of-court statement to any degree. Whether or not it's being used for the truth of the matter asserted is irrelevant if there's no statement being involved here. If you aren't familiar with objections, I have a free objection cheat sheet. It goes through the 21 top trial objections. It also goes through a breakdown of each one and responses for each one as well. The cheat sheet's super helpful with being able to help train you to quickly respond and identify to when you should be objecting or how you should be responding to those objections. Definitely check that out. This bad boy has so many thousands of downloads. I've lost count, but it's been helpful for a lot of people and something that you should either get as it slides above or down in the description below. But with all that said, let's dive back in. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. You didn't know what could cause damage to Mr. Depp's hand while you were there on March 8th, correct? Dr. Kipper told me he sustained an injury on uh, one of his well, fingers. Uh, objection, Here's, hearsay. Wait, you, you asked the question. Okay. Oh. Next question. Okay, he said he sustained a, an injury to his finger. Yes. I just, for the first time, just saw Johnny Depp laughing and trying to keep it together. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny. So, quick water break. Okay, so I just paused everything in order to break down whether or not this hearsay objection is valid. So the question is, I'm kind of shortening it a little bit. You didn't know what could cause damage to Mr. Depp's hand while you were there, correct? Now, the answer is Dr. Kipper told me X, Y, and Z. The objection came in, so it cut off the actual quote of Dr. Kipper coming from the witness. Step by step, let's break this down. Dr. Kipper, in the context of hearsay, is a declarant. The quote of Dr. Kipper is an out-of-court statement. Just because it's an out-of-court statement, though, does not mean that it's automatically hearsay. In that situation, you have to go beyond the fact that a statement is being made outside of the courtroom. You need to look at the context of the statement to determine whether or not it's being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, i.e., the substance of the statement itself. If you're not familiar with truth of the matter asserted, if everything I just said sounds like crazy Latin, then check out the sliding video above on truth of the matter asserted. If I've maxed out the amount of links that I can slide above, I'll put it in the description below for you to look at. Okay, so let's break it down. The question again is, you didn't know what could cause damage to Mr. Depp's hand while you were there. So asking about the knowledge of the witness. The witness in a roundabout way is saying, Yes, I did know because Dr. Kipper, the declarant in this situation, told me this out-of-court statement. So is the out-of-court statement being used to prove the substance of that statement? Well, we've never actually heard Dr. Kipper's statement, but I think a strong argument can be made that no, this is not being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Instead, Dr. Kipper's statement is being quoted to show the effect on the listener, meaning the witness. Let's break that down a little bit more. So Dr. Kipper made a statement. That statement had an effect on the witness who's testifying. The effect of that statement is what gave the knowledge to be able to answer yes to this question, that the witness did know what caused damage to Mr. Depp's hand. So in this scenario, instead of proving the truth of the matter asserted with this out-of-court statement, I don't think that's actually applicable here. I think this out-of-court statement is being offered to show the effect of that statement on the witness in this situation, which would make it not hearsay. But you don't know what cause, you don't know how his finger was injured, correct? I don't think anybody mentioned it to me at that time. Right, no one mentioned it to you at that time, correct? Same objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Sorry, I'll allow it. Next question. 
notice that this is basically the same question that was being asked previously that I disagreed with the judge on because it's not involving an out of court statement. It's involving the opposite, the lack of out of court statements. And in this context here, Depp's lawyer objects to hearsay is like, again, hearsay. And the judge, I believe correctly overruled that objection because again, we're not dealing with an out of court statement. I'm a little confused now on why this Dr. Kipper out of court statement was being used by the witness and being quoted by the witness. I'm starting to think if he's saying now that nobody told him anything on the cause, then he was trying to almost in bad faith incorporate Dr. Kipper's out of court statement beyond the parameters of the question and beyond the, uh, the scope of the question involving the timeline. And that's why the cross-examining attorney started panicking. And if that's the case, if Dr. Kipper's out of court statement is really harmful to Amber Heard's case, and it's known what that statement is, which most likely I would assume that this cross-examining attorney does know what the statement was going to be and the effects of that statement, whether it's super harmful or if it's you know not an issue whatsoever, then if it is going to be super harmful, then hopefully Amber Heard's lawyers filed a motion in limine in order to prevent witnesses just like this from being able to just willy nilly throw out these harmful hearsay objectionable statements. Okay, I got to call it. We're not even five minutes into this video and I feel like I've been talking forever. There's been a lot to comment on and I feel like this actual YouTube video is going to be longer than I was wanting and it's because I'm not talking about the good because there's not a lot of good. We're talking about the bad and the ugly. We're really breaking this down. I think there's a lot of helpful information here, but it's it's this is a tough watch. And when I said secondhand embarrassment at the beginning of this, I truly meant it. So let's maybe break down some key takeaways. The first one is it really comes down to your preparation. I think this cross-examining lawyer is justifiably a little nervous for the stage he's on. I understand not wanting to become an international meme by having some crazy mistake, but I also do not sympathize with not asking great hard-hitting cross-examination questions when you have the luxury to be able to prepare those questions in advance and push come to shove if you need to refer to your outline or a script you should be able to do that and have those tough questions i just didn't hear a single tough question during the five minutes or so of this video that i watched and so that i think is due to the lack of preparation takeaway number two as you can probably tell from this video, you need to know your objections inside and out. And that gets us back to preparation. As you're going through your cross-examination, anticipate what the witness may say and also anticipate what the other side's lawyer may object to. In doing so, you can maybe anticipate that the witness is going to try and bring in an out-of-court statement so you can try and craft that cross-examination to exclude that situation or include that motion in limine. Or if you hear an objection from the other side that you've anticipated, then hopefully prepare your objection response and have that in your back pocket to be able to rattle off. This is all happening in a very short amount of time. You hear the objection, you hear the hopeful response, and then the judge is reaching quick rulings and you need to be able to respond appropriately and as quickly as possible. Again, check out the cheat sheet that was sliding above earlier and that's in the description below. My third takeaway is the cross-examination, while I can tell this lawyer is nervous, lacks any type of direction for me as a viewer. What I mean by this is I have no idea which questions are important. I have no idea if I should even be paying attention. Whenever you have a, an effective cross-examination, it's all about pace. Can you have the proper pace to show that you're in control? If there's a pace and a back and forth, then I'm in it. There's energy in the conversation. I'm watching. And then if you also strategically pause at certain points, it tends to bring the viewer in once you break up that rhythm and you can really emphasize what you're trying to pull out of your cross-examination. This cross-examining attorney was just fumbling through it and trying to get through it. 
in order to hopefully get some puzzle pieces to use during a closing argument. It was a tough watch. It was a very tough watch. So again, preparation, know your objections and establish some type of delivery for your cross-examination that's going to be effective. I felt like all three were lacking in what I just saw right here. Not trying to totally flame this cross-examining attorney, but this clip I saw, it was tough to watch. It was very tough to watch. But if you have any questions, critiques, comments, thoughts, or if you just wanna say hi, if you're a Law Venture member, you know the drill. Leave those in the comment section down below. If you're new to Law Venture, then consider subscribing. And if you're still watching at this point, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to smash that like button down below.